Thank you so much for joining us today. As we dive into Backyard Conversations this weekend, we will be discussing sensitive topics not advised for those fourth grade and younger. We strongly encourage parents to make sure your children join Chapel Kids during service. And if you need any assistance in registering your kids, be sure to stop by Starting Point in the main lobby. Thank you for your understanding, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. Do 
praise the Lord this morning. Come on. I'm just gonna praise you, praise you, praise you in the morning. says that he inhabits the praise of his people. So when we choose to praise God, not only are we saying, you know what, whatever I'm standing in, Lord, you're above it. I choose you. But we're also inviting God in to move, to do whatever he wants to do. So church, just sing this bridge with me. Again, as we just pursue the Lord together this morning, as we cry out to God, we need you, we love you, we honor you. Inhabit our praise, God. Come on and just sing something. Something happens when we praise you. The heaven opens when we lift our voice. Our melody is a mighty wind. Never stop singing. Never stop singing something. Something happens.
your grace, oh, he breaks the power, he breaks the power of canceled sin, he says the prisoner free, his blood can make the foulest clean, his blood of
awesome to sing here with you, such a privilege to sing together with you. And guys, let's rejoice in that awesome prayer that we just sang, that we can build our lives upon our awesome God. Guys, I rejoice in that together with you today. You may all be seated, and please turn your attention to the screen for the Bible Chapel update. Hi, I'm Josh. Hey, I'm Susie. And whether you're in person or you're online, welcome. welcome. If you are newer to the Bible Chapel and haven't already, be sure to stop by Starting Point in the main lobby mm -hmm. where our Connections team would love to give you a sweet treat and gift for just being here today. I love that. <laughs> and for those of you joining us online, we would love to meet you too. Yeah. So if you haven't already, be sure to fill out a Connect card at BibleChapel.org slash new. Part of worshiping God happens through giving. And we have two ways for you to give today. At the back of the worship center, there are bins available where you can drop off your giving or you can go give online at biblechapel.org slash give. That's right. Hey, mark your calendars, church, because our 2023-2024 small group registration goes live Ooh. August 5th. Yeah. And we want you to join us. We were never meant to live alone. That's and we right. want to come alongside you as you find community at TV. BC. So for more information about small groups, visit BibleChapel.org slash small groups. Our upward flag football and cheerleading yes. season begins on August 14th. Coaches, chaplains, referees, scorekeepers, there's a place for you to serve. Mm -hmm. For more information and to register, visit BibleChapel.org slash sports. I love that. And listen, before you leave today, be sure to stop by our ministry pop-up out there in the main lobby where our Chapel Kids ministry is featured today. That's right. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for joining us today. Let's continue with our service. Good morning. So good to see everyone in person and always you guys online as well. I want to welcome you to a kickoff of our Backyard Conversation Summer Sermon Series. So we did this last year and we uh, decided to do more of an apologetics a sermon series, a defense of the Christian faith, why we believe what we believe. This year we said, what if we just ask you, the congregation, to give us feedback. What are some of the things that you would like to hear about, to be discussed? And so you did that, and that has been, the, that's the topics of our series. So we're going to look at a lot of things over the next few weeks, and today we're going to start this week and next week with a question that a lot of you ask, 
Question is this, how do we respond to the LGBTQ plus community? How do we do that uh, as a church? How do we do that personally? Now, in that question, there were, uh, there were, a, lot of, uh, there were a lot of other questions. Um, how do we deal with, biblically, same-sex attraction? Um, what if there is a monogamous relationship between a man and a man and a woman and a woman? Is that okay? Um, transsexuality, what does the Bible say about that? H- how do I respond to a friend uh, going through this? How do I respond to a child going through this? And I know that, uh, that that's the case of many. So I also want to say before we start this series, uh, if you are new with us, or you're a guest with us, we cover these types of issues a lot as we go through the Bible. As you preach through the Bible, and we're committed to do that here, you're going to deal a lot with sexuality. You just can't help but if you're looking at the verses of Scripture. And so uh, we have had many series in the past on, uh, on sexuality. Uh, right, actually, right before COVID, uh, we, were, we were in a series on sexuality as well, and then COVID hit and we kind of took a, a different turn there. Um, I lead a ministry called The Journey, uh, along with my responsibilities here, and over the years, w- we have dealt with that subject a lot. Uh, we started on the radio locally and then expanded, and the first series we did in our expansion uh, uh, nationally was uh, biblical sexuality, not, not to draw attention, but just to say we believe that we need to speak into culture on this issue. We've done many podcasts through the journey uh, with on sexuality, and in our upcoming season with Journey Podcast, we'll be doing uh, things along the same lines as well. So I just wanted to let you know that this isn't like a, a one-off because you asked those questions, although you did. These are things we, we have to address. Everybody understand where I'm coming from there, right? So... Um, in backyard conversations, what we want to do is to help you with conversations that uh, that will um, that will allow you to share the gospel with people in your neighborhoods. We have a conversation starter card that you can take as you leave. It's going to be uh, right as as you leave, so be sure to grab this. But I want to tell you about another conversation starter, and I would challenge every parent and every grandparent to do this as a conversation starter. Google, Google, Geneva College fires soccer coach. Geneva, not now, don't do it right now. Uh, But after the service, Geneva College fires soccer coach. It will be a fascinating discussion to have with your kids. Let me give you just a little bit of it. So Geneva College, great college in the area, Christian college, values that we would hold to. Uh, they had a coach who was the women's soccer coach, and the article I read, the only thing I know about this is from the article I read, so granted, there's some limitations there. Uh, in the article, uh, this uh, young woman, 26-year-old, uh, was described as a gay Christian. Uh, she is a celibate, living a lifestyle, uh, not practicing homosexuality. And the tipping point seemed to be when she put something on, uh, when she posted something on Instagram, and here's what she posted on Instagram. Queer people offer precious gifts to the church. Don't miss out. And then she had another post with a photo. Uh, Jesus is radically inclusive, and she had a quote from um, the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Geneva College made it very clear that they do not discipline or expel any student who is dealing with same-sex attraction, that temptation. They made that clear. So there's something else going on here, and I'll let you read the article to figure out. But as we, I, I bring that article up because it is, it just, it gives you all the, it gives you all the areas where this is being played out in our culture. Education, right? This conversation is being had in education. If you're a student or a teacher, me and you know that. From the pronouns you are supposed to use to the things you say and can't say, you know it's going on there. By the way, that is in public and private education 
as well. You also know that it is in sports. This was a soccer coach. It's in sports. From the, from the, from the pride nights of professional sports to the whole conversation going on, should a man who transitions into a woman or trans, transitions to a woman be able to participate in women's sports? Big issue going on, right? In colleges and, 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 and professionals are beginning to talk about it as well. This conversation, you know this, is happening in social media, TikTok, Instagram, all the time. And so you have these influence, our kids are, are, are getting saturated with this, uh, influencers all the time coming out and saying, oh, by the way, uh, you know, I got you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers, and by the way, I am pansexual, or I'm omnisexual, or I'm bisexual, or whatever. And so our kids, so this is happening on the internet as it happened here at Geneva. It's also a huge issue in the evangelical church. By the way, evangelical church, evangelical camp believes these four things. We believe that Jesus died for our sins on the cross and that only through Jesus can you have a relationship with the living God, right? We believe that the Bible is the final authority for life and living. We believe you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, and evangelicals believe that we should be evangelical, that we should share the message of Christ. We should tell others about Jesus. That's what an evangelical is. Within the evangelical camp, it's a lot of debate. Within evangelical camp, there are two sides. There's what's called side A, affirming, that's what uh, Miss Morrison was promoting when she said that, right? Affirming church. That's within the evangelical church. And then there's the non-affirming, side B. We'll be talking about that as we go through the series. Uh, I'm part of a, a, a group of pastors in the north, uh, Northeast that we meet a couple times a year. And the last time we met, we spent about three hours late into the evening a group of about 12, 13, 14 guys, um, late into the evening discussing this very issue. And so it's in the evangelical uh, church. Um, certainly in politics, all the way to the Supreme Court, right? But you know what? It's very personal, too. And uh, I have no doubt some of you in this room uh, are struggling with same-sex attraction. Uh, we're going to talk about that. I have no doubt in this room, some of you parents, I've talked to many of you, uh, have a, a parent or a grandparent, grandchild uh, struggling or, 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 or practicing in this area. Um, how do you deal with that? How, how, do, you, how do you respond to that? Um, do you, do you go to a same-sex wedding? How do, you, how do you deal with that? So that's what we want to be talking about over the next two weeks. A lot of questions. We're always going to go to Scripture and see what Jesus says, what the Bible says regarding that. And let's pray, and then we'll, we'll dive in. Father, thank you. You're a God who loves us, and you care for us, and you know us intimately. So you know everything going on in our lives. And so, Father, we're praying that you, uh, that you, that you speak clearly to us, um, that you allow us to see your word clearly and how you want us to respond um, to, to friends, to family members, uh, to, the, to those in, in our life. And so, uh, so teach us, Father, as only you can do, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so here's what I want to do today, and again, we're going to talk about this next time, so, so two parts, so hang with me through this. We're going to build a framework for how we should respond, a biblical framework for how we should respond. Some of you say, I want to look at this verse, this verse, this verse, and this verse, just, pack, just be patient, right? Pack your patience on this. We're going to get there. 
But we, that would be a mistake to dive into those without looking at a biblical framework. So we're going to look at a biblical framework. We're going to get one passage in today. And then next time, we're going to answer as many questions as we can uh, with the passages that we look at. If you have questions, you can email me uh, at ronmore.org, but always uh, copy K Cree, K C R E E, at biblechapel.org. And I'll do my best to answer them, but if we need to answer in a different form, we'll do that too, because we want to equip believers to do what God has called us to do. All right, let's build the framework. The first thing we need to do in response to the LGBTQ community, right? First thing we need to do, conversation always starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We miss out when we do not start with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when I say gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not saying, okay, four spiritual laws, uh, you know, God loves you, he died for your sins, uh, trust in Christ. That, that's the gospel, but the gospel is the A to Z of the Christian life. The gospel is what ca carries power. When Paul writes first uh, to the Romans, uh, first chapter of the Romans, and we're going to look at this. Before he gets into Romans 1, where he talks about specific sins, a whole list of sins, idolatry, lust, homosexuality, all these sins, before he gets into that, what does he do? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, for I am not ashamed of what? The gospel. Why am I not ashamed of the gospel? Because it is the power of God to all who believe. It is the power of God. And if we believe in the power of God that the Holy Spirit is at work and will do his work, we can't fix everything, but we start with the most important, and that is pointing people to Jesus, a God who loves us and cares for us and came to die on a cross for all our sins. And it's Jesus who gives us identity, the world is looking for a place of identity. This is the biggest issue I believe Gen Z is dealing with. And so in the gospel, you find your identity. You finally find a place where you are accepted unconditionally. And when you fail, you are forgiven. There is no other identity like being in Christ. Now, I will say this. When we talk about sexuality, it ups the ante for all of us because our identity might be in our work or our identity might be in our kids or our identity might, might be in a hobby. Anytime we have an identity in any, as Christians in anything other than Jesus, that is called what? Idolatry. And so it ups the ante for all of us. Where is your identity? Where really is your identity? In, in, in the aspect of sexuality, our identity is not in our sexuality. Our identity is in Jesus. And it's him we follow. And it's him we love. And, and when we say our identity is in Jesus, that's just not like, well, you know, Jesus makes you feel good. When we say our identity is in Jesus, we say he is our authority. He is our savior. He's the king and we live in his kingdom and we live under his authority and with his authority. We, are, we want to follow what Jesus says, and we want to demonstrate what it looks like to follow hard after him. There's a passage in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I think this is such a strong, there are so many passages on identity, but man, you got to start with this one. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and uh, this is uh, beginning in verse 9. Paul says this, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Rhetorical question. Paul says, don't you know that if you're going to live an unrighteous life, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God? And so we would ask the question, Paul, who are you talking about? What's the unrighteous? And so Paul says, glad you asked. Look at verse, look at the rest of the verse. Do you not know? Don't be deceived. Neither sexual and immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you notice the asterisk there by the worst sins. Did you see the asterisk? 
You didn't because there is no asterisk, right? It's all there. And then Paul says this, so powerful. Here's the gospel. Such were some of you. That's who you were. But you're not that anymore. You've been washed. You've been cleansed by Jesus. You have been sanctified. You've been set apart to follow the king. And you've been justified. Your sins have been forgiven. When you, the justification, what a powerful theological word. It means this. When we trust in Jesus, we trust in him, God looks at us, and he says, you're a sinner, but you trusted in my son who died for your sins. I made him who knew no sin to be sin for you so that you could be called the righteousness of God. So you are declared not guilty. And then, doesn't stop there. Not only are you, not, you declared not guilty, I am clothing you with the right, to, think about this, I am clothing you with the righteousness of Jesus. I am putting the robe, as it were, the robe of righteousness around you. So, so just think about this as a believer. You know, you know your heart, I know my heart. I would not want you to know what I'm thinking or feeling, or my secret, right? Would you want me to know yours? I take that as a no. All right. When we stand before God, he doesn't see all this stuff inside of us. What's he see? Jesus. We have been cleansed. We have been washed. We've been set apart. We've been sanctified by Jesus. I love the C.S. Lewis quote. C.S. Lewis says this in his book, Weight of Glory, great book. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. The sun has risen in the sky. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not because, not only because I see it, the sun, but because by it, what? I see everything else. Man, when we believe in Jesus and when we trust in him and when we follow, when our identity is in him, we say, I believe in him because I see the transformation he can make in your life, but by him, I, I see differently everything else. We got to start with the gospel. Now, when we start with the gospel, we're saying our identity is in Jesus, right? Right? So the first question we ha have to ask, if I'm following Jesus, and I, I believe in Jesus, and he's my authority, then what does he say? How would he respond to the LGBTQ plus community? We could go a lot of places here, and next week we'll talk even more specifically. But one of the passages that we need to look at is in Luke chapter 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just summarize it real quick. Luke chapter 10. So there's a lawyer who comes to Jesus. This lawyer is an expert in the Old Testament law. And he tries to trick Jesus by saying, Jesus, tell me, which is the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? Knowing or thinking, if Jesus would pick one, then they could trap him. What about the others? So here's the beauty of what Jesus does. In the Old Testament, there are hundreds of laws. They are summarized where? Where? In the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a summary of the law. When you look at the Ten Commandments, there are what's called two tables of the Ten Commandments. Commandment 1 through 6, table 1. Commandment 7 through 10, table 2. So what's Jesus do? He summarizes both tables. He says, let me tell you what the greatest commandment is. Let me summarize the first six. He quotes from Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God, what? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love God. That's a, a summation of the first six. And then he quotes from Leviticus 19. It's a whole law, a whole section on loving your neighbor. And then he adds what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so the lawyer says, well, I can't argue with loving the Lord your God with all your heart, but, but who's my neighbor? 
My neighbors, is that someone who loves me and I love them? Is it a person who lives next door, two doors down? Who's my neighbor? Surely my enemy is not my neighbor. Surely someone I don't agree with is not my neighbor. So Jesus said, let me tell you a story. And what story does he tell? The parable of the good Samaritan. Today we tell the story. That was the most radical story Jesus could have told. It's about a guy, you know the story. He's a Jewish guy. He goes on a journey. He gets beaten by robbers. They steal everything from him. They beat him and leave him for dead. He's, he's beaten, bloodied on the road, left for dead in the middle of the road. And Jesus says, who comes by first? A religious guy, one of those church people. And he comes by and looks at the guy and walks around him, over him, and keeps on going. And then another church person comes by, and he does exactly the same thing. He walks around the guy, and then a Samaritan comes. Now, think of the context. Jews hated Samaritans with a passion, and Samaritans hated Jews with a passion. What's going to happen when a Samaritan comes? The Samaritan's going to say, good for you. Finally got what was deserving to you. I'm glad you got beaten. I'm glad you got bloody. Persecuted, man, you deserved it. But Jesus says, Samaritan, stop. Took care of the guy, bandaged him up. Took him to an inn, which would have been the nearest place of care. Asked the innkeeper to take care of him. Paid for all the processes. And said, I'm going on a journey, but I'm going to be back by, and, and I'll pay you for whatever I need to. And then Jesus asked the question to, the, to that uh, lawyer. Remember the question? So who was the neighbor? Man, what a powerful story. You see, as Christians, we don't want anyone persecuted. We don't want anyone beaten or bullied. As Christians, our neighbor is anyone God puts in our path. And we're to respond, as Jesus did, with compassion. By the way, Jesus was terribly criticized for hanging out with sinners. But what else did Jesus do when he met a sinner? Always told them the truth. Always told them the truth. That's the second part. We need to be those who respond with compassion and truth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says this. By the way, this is a passage where Paul is saying, you need to grow up. You need to be mature believers. Here's how you can become mature believers. Speaking the truth in love, right? We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. There are two characteristics, well, there are many characteristics of immature believers, but there are two. An immature believer will beat you over the head with their Bible, and you can't hear anything they say because you're hurting because you're getting beat over the head, right? That's immaturity. You may know scripture well. That's immaturity. The other hand is compassion. Just do what you want to do. I love you, whatever. It's okay. It's your life. Compassion. That's immaturity. Very much so. What's the balance? What's what's, uh, Paul saying? You speak the truth, right? Never back down on the truth. In what? Love. First Peter chapter 15. Or, there's not 15 chapters in First Peter. But there, in chapter 3, there are 15 verses. So First Peter 3, 15. Peter is writing, to, by the, check this out, the context. Peter is writing to those who are going to be persecuted. He's writing to believers. He said, get ready for the persecution. And he says this, First Peter 3, 15. But in your heart set Honor Christ as Lord. Set apart Christ as Lord, another translation says. And then he says, always be prepared 
Always be prepared. You're going to be standing in people who are getting ready to put you to death, but you're going to have a tremendous opportunity. Always be prepared to make a defense. That word defense is a apologia in the Greek. We get the word apology from it, but it doesn't mean I'm sorry. It means I am making a defense for my case. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is within you. We have to be prepared, right? Parents, you need to be prepared. You have any excuses. You got to be prepared to know what you believe. You You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. Guys, we have to do that. And when we do that, we, we speak the truth in love. Peter says it this way, speak the truth, be prepared, don't back down, be bold, yet, what? Read it with me. It's right there on the screen. <laughs> Gentleness and what? Respect. You speak the truth in love, but always with gentleness and respect. Sean McDowell is a Christian writer, an an apologist, Um, actually going to be at the Bible Chapel, I think in 2024 in the spring, and uh, he writes a great book, Um, I'll I'll show it to you next week, a great book I think all parents should read. And in the book, he talks about CNN calling him to do an interview right after Bruce Jenner, the Olympian, the gold medal winner, Bruce Jenner transition to Caitlyn Jenner. And they wanted him to speak into that. They wanted him to do an interview. And so, um, he, you know, he said, all right, I'll, I'll do the interview over the phone. And uh, they said, well, d- before you do it, tell us what you're going to say. He said, all right. Jesus, here's what I'm going to say. Jesus loves transgender people. The issue has become too political. The research shows that transgender people are more likely to suffer from loneliness, depression, and suicide than the general population. Thus, we need to reach across the political aisle and find common ground with others for the sake of helping men and women who are transgender. I'm quoting from the book. After a long silence, the CNN producer finally spoke, and I will never forget what he said. I'm sorry, I can't have you on the show. You're much too compassionate. (laughs) You see, CNN wants someone to be the token, stereotypical bigot. And by the way, that's what Satan wants as well, isn't it? We have the truth. And we can speak it in love, in gentleness, in respect. All right, so what's the truth? How do we get prepared? Well, to do that, we're going to look at a lot of passages next week. But we need to start at the beginning. And so we'll go, the time left, to Genesis chapter 1 and 2, before sin entered the world. So in Genesis chapter 1, as you know, there is like this... um, a broad stroke of creation. And then in Genesis 2, there's more uh, specific regarding the creation of man and woman. So let's check this out. In chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God said in chapter, in a verse uh, 28, God blessed the male and the female and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and birds of the, uh, uh, birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So let's just think through this. <clears throat> First of all, man was created in the image of God, right? What does that mean? That means every person has been given what theology is called communicable attributes. There are some incommunicable attributes that only God has and only God can have, but there are communicable attributes that he gives to us that allows us to be made in his image. 
like life and being able to produce life. Personality, truth, wisdom, love, holiness, and justice. That's the list of the communicable attributes all in your sermon notes if you want to go look. By the way, the only way, the only way we can have a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God, is because we have these communicable attributes. So with these communicable attributes, God creates what? Male and female. God creates two distinct genders. The male has parts that make him a male. The female has parts that make her a female. And you can't argue with that. That's not only theology 101, that's biology 101. So what does God do with these two people, right? Well, let's get more specific as chapter 2 he says this, the Lord said, the Lord God said to the man, remember this is a, uh, chapter 127 is an overview, the Lord God said to the man, it is not good for the man to be what? Alone, I will make a helper fit for him. By the way, helper in scripture is not a demeaning word. It's normally a word used to describe God himself. In the Psalms, all the time in the Psalms, God is my what? Helper. Same word, I will not be afraid. God, it's usually used of God. And so God creates a counterpart, a completer of the man. Creative completion. And he brings the man together. And he creates the woman. And he creates male and female. Again, this isn't based on feeling. This isn't based on gender fluidity. This is based on the parts that God gives you, either male or female. And he gives those parts for a certain reason. In chapter 1, verse 28, he says what? Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The only way you can obey that command be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is when a man and a woman come together in a one flesh relationship. You can't do it anywhere else. It doesn't work in same sex relationships. God, God's, God's basic creation of male and female starts with the fact of biology and allows people to replenish the earth. And God's not finished. In chapter 2, verse 24, a verse repeated by Christ in the Gospels by Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, says, for this reason. By the way, uh, uh, Moses is writing this. He's writing this after the creation. It's been revealed to him. And, And a lot of people, a lot of commentators say, uh, uh, 224 is like a parenthesis. So here, here's what God created, male and female, this one flesh relationship to replenish the earth. And then it's like Moses saying, okay, time out. This is why we do what we do. This is why we have this marriage thing. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and together they will become one flesh. That's God's design. A man in a woman, in a marriage relationship, for life. That's it. That's basic. That's where we have to start. In compassion, and love, and respect, but that's where you start. Now, if you would say, which many people do today, well, I don't believe that ancient stuff anyway. I don't believe the Bible to be true. All right. You got to agree with this. Sex makes babies, right? It's biology. 
The only way a society continues is when babies are born. If you don't believe that, Google Japan, um, I don't know, Google Japan and babies or whatever. Uh, 800,000 babies were born last year. 1.6 million people died. Japan says, we got, the prime minister says, we got an issue here. Our society will not last long like this. And we got to do something. And, and the prime minister of Japan says, we're going to do everything we can to support families with babies. But then that's the third thing. Sex make babies, right? Babies make societies, and societies only continue if there is a husband and a wife and a, and a mom and a dad in a loving relationship to raise that child. By the way, why do countries have marriage as legally binding? Because they want to make it as hard as possible. We could argue if it is as hard as possible to break the bind, to break the com commitment. They want to make it hard. Because every community knows that if you don't have a husband and a wife, a man and a woman, a mom and a dad raising children, you got problems in that society. That's, that's, not, that's without scripture. That's just, that's just basic sociology. And we can see it all over the place. We'll talk about marriage in a couple of weeks, but you don't have a mom and dad involved in the picture. I'm not talking about two women. I'm not talking about two men. I'm talking about a man and a woman. You've got issues. All right. I've got a story to tell. I'm going to come down. I've got to go way over here because we don't have the stairs yet. And I went down there the first time and got in trouble, so I'm walking around. <laughs> so we're going to talk next week about some of the passages. We'll get into the passages. We'll get into some of the debated passages uh, in the evangelical with the side A and side B and all that. It's for next week. But, but guys, we have to start with this framework, right? So uh, I had a, a friend a, a great friend, and uh, grew up with him. Um, he went to Dallas Seminary, and uh, we used to get together, and uh, he'd come up here a lot of times, and we would do projects around our house. We, we, had, we had a blast. And sometimes he would say, let's study this, this book. It would be a Christian book, or let's study a portion of Scripture. And um, we did, and we, again, we had, a, we had a great time, just a great time. And then one day, uh, he told me he was gay. And he did some really foolish things that hurt a lot of people. But one thing he told me that kind of broke my heart, he said, when I was there, after we would, you know, be together all day doing projects, I, I, would, I would go to bed and cry. Because another day went by, and I didn't tell you what was going on in my life. And I look back on that. I don't know what would have changed, but I, I regret that. I regret that somewhere in me, he didn't see, he knew where I stood, but he didn't see enough compassion or, or, or safety to talk with me about that situation. Would I have changed the truth? No. No. Man, I wish I'd have had that opportunity to, to talk with him about the temptations he was going through. When we don't lead with the gospel and when we don't lead with compassion, we don't get to tell the truth. And so we have to start at the most important spots, always sharing the truth in love. Listen to this song, and then we'll close. I've seen of common, I've 
I've started Stand with me as we pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that for those of, of us who know you, there was a day when you interrupted our life and we are not who we used to be. We know, as the old theologian says, every seed of every sin is planted in our heart but you met us and you washed us and you cleansed us and you justified us and our identity is now in Jesus and we don't know where we would be or what we would do without Jesus. So Father, we pray that we would always speak truth. We will never back down on your word, but we'll do it so people can hear 
with gentleness and love, with respect, with compassion. May we be those who share the gospel passionately and compassionately. Help us, Lord, as we go to address the issues in our life we need to address so that we can be those who not only speak the truth, but practice the truth so our words and our actions match up. Be with us, Father, as we leave. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said together, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. We'll see you next time.